Dear friends, welcome to this question-answer series presented by Dr. Johnson C. Philip. Dr. Philip has spent his whole life answering young and old on an unbelievably wide range of subjects. His ultimate aim is to help you to find answers to your questions and even doubts. In turn this will help you in multiple ways. Dr. Philip keeps posting question answers regularly. Many of these can be very helpful to you. Do not miss any of them. Please subscribe to our channel and you will get notice of each and every video as it is posted. It is easy to subscribe. Below this video you will see a subscribe icon. Please click it. Please also click to bell icon there to confirm your subscription. That is all. You will never miss any of these life transforming videos. God bless you. We have been studying a series of connected subjects. And these subjects are connected on purpose. On purpose because often the teaching of uh, biblical doctrines is disjoint, a hit and miss affair. And because of that, many times believers are unable to link doctrines with each other. Worse, Believers are unable to link doctrines with practical life. We already looked at fundamentals. That was our first subject in English. And I reminded you that what makes us what we are is our commitment to fundamentals. The second subject was justification by faith. In the Old Testament, no Jew could ever approach God directly. He always had to approach God through a priest. But in New Testament, God elevated us to the position of priests and gave us direct access to God. And today when we have direct access to God, we don't have to go to him with a chalice of blood. The blood of Christ has purified us. And the moment the blood of Christ purified us, God also covered us with the, the righteousness of Christ so that when God looks at us, he spots us as righteous people. That's why we have direct access to God. But once God grants us positional righteousness, he expects us to manifest that righteousness through our everyday works. That is a uh, the almost the theme of the epistle of Jake, James. And if uh, there is anyone here who has not given sufficient time to the study of the epistle of James, I would request you to go back to James. It's not very difficult. James is a rather a straightforward presentation where the Holy Spirit makes it very clear that if you are justified positionally, you are expected to demonstrate the fact that you are justif justified through your works. So justification is positional, justification is experiential, and then there is an ultimate justification. Linked with that is the doctrine of sanctification. Usually we use the word holiness to denote things similar to sanctification. But sanctification is much more than holiness. Sanctification produces holiness and therefore sanctification is the broader term. Last week, the Lord helped us to look at uh, the background of sanctification and uh, I mentioned 2 Timothy 2 verses 20 and 21, where the scripture makes it very clear that though God has different purpose for each one of us, and though God appoints us for different activities, at the same time, whether we are really in the will of God, whether that purpose is going to be fulfilled in our life, and a lot of other things, they depend upon us. It is up to us to make us vessels of gold or silver. And it is 
up to us to make us vessels of dishonor, vessels of honor, vessels of dishonor. Within Christian life, we often see people whose life is so dishonorable that it is impossible to call them a Christian. What is worse, it is impossible to identify ourselves with, ourselves with them. Particularly when we get into society and where people would ask us, oh, isn't that person also uh, somebody like you? He also claims to be a believer, but his life is so different. That all depends upon our sanctification also. There are two words related to sanctification. Let me look at the words first. And then we will come to the doctrinal aspect of it. In the Old, Old Testament, Hebrew uses the word quados, Q, Q A, quados or quados, and quodus, the two forms of the same word. It comes from a root which means to cut off, to separate to set apart. So in the Old Testament, when the concept of sanctification is introduced, it means separating something from that which is common or profane and setting it apart so that now this has no connection with that. This word is used in many places and that actually those usages make it clear exactly what sanctification means. The temple was sanctified. It was set apart from all other buildings. A person with proper permission could enter any other building, but not the temple of God. The temple of God had different courts and only people with proper authorization could enter those places. And the holiest of the holies, only the high priest could enter and that also once every year. Therefore, the temple of God is said to be sanctified or set apart. And we see these references in Psalm 5.7. Isaiah 64.11. I'm not going to read any of these verses. I'm quoting them for your reference. We will read only those verses which we will expound in greater detail. Also Habakkuk 2.20. I will repeat once again, Sam 5.7. Isaiah 64.11. Habakkuk 2.20. And brothers, and sisters, I hope all of you are sitting there with your diaries and pen, Bible diaries and pen. I also hope and pray that the Zoom sickness has not affected you. You may ask what is Zoom sickness? Zoom sickness is a sickness seen among Christian believers in the last 18 years where they realize that when we st stand, when we sit in front of the camera, we can easily switch off the video and therefore we can sit as we are. I have seen many semi naked people sitting and attending Bible classes, semi naked people lying in bed and attending Bible classes. And a lot of people, those who come to attend, they don't they don't pick up the Bible. They just want the preacher to quote it or somebody to post it in the comment box. That's the reason why I requested people not to post Bible verses in the comment boxes. Only the references are to be posted. And brothers and sisters, if we become victims of this Zoom disease or Zoom sickness, it will destroy our Bible study habits. And therefore, I'm sure you're all sitting there with your Bibles, diaries, and pens. By any chance, if you forgot your diary today, 
you are in front of zoom so you have enough time to dash to the diary and pick it up and if you don't have a diary please arrange one because uh, brethren theological institute classes these are not messages these are also not devotions these are also not simple bible classes these are a little more advanced topics presented in a simple manner please note down and please do read those verses in spare time and as the holy spirit illuminates you please note down the illumination that comes to you so the temple is said to be separate not only that the ark of covenant is said to be separate or sanctified we find one reference in second chronicles 35:3 second chronicles 35:3 inside the uh, tabernacle there was bread show bread it was said to be sanctified or separated or holy we see the references in leviticus 24:9 and also first samuel 2:14 as you read first samuel 2:14 you would understand the significance of something that is sanctified leviticus 24:9 first samuel 21:4 also many vessels are said to be sanctified first kings 8:4 first chronicles 2219 let me repeat first kings 84 first chronicles 2219 garments are said to be sanctified they are set apart for a special purpose exodus 282 exodus 282 also festivals celebrated by the people of god are said to be sanctified or set apart because they are to be celebrated by the people of god we read an example in nehemiah 89 nehemiah 89 in fact the entire chapter and the chapters after this are to be read very carefully to study the idea of sanctification as god sees it sabbath is a day said to be set apart god declared it to be holy that is set apart from all other days and all other festivals we see that in exodus 28 and also 11 exodus chapter 20 verses 8 and verse 11 isaiah 5813 isaiah 5813 in the old testament they were supposed to bring tithes for god since they belonged to god every child of god was supposed to and expected to separate them unto god and so the tithes were also said to be sanctified or set apart we read that in leviticus chapter 27 verses 30 to 33 leviticus chapter 27 verses 30 to 33 not only these things but also people are said to be set apart for god or sanctified we see that in deuteronomy 7 6 and chapter deuteronomy chapter 14 verses 2 and 21 let me repeat deuteronomy people are said to be sanctified deuteronomy 7 6 and also deuteronomy 14 2 and 21 i gave you this background but did not read the verses because the main purpose of giving you this background is to encourage you to read and study these things and also to remind you that there there is a lot of background to the study of doctrine of sanctification actually pick up any biblical doctrine there is a lot of background and brothers and sisters we should make it a habit to go through that background to understand the full impact of that doctrine so 
sanctification in the Old Testament. Now we come to New Testament where the concept of sanctification is elaborated in much detail. Of course, uh, the books of the law where God had given the people of God a social law, ceremonial law and moral law, that big codex made of three volumes itself shows that God wants his people to be separated, sanctified. And then when we come to New Testament, the New Testament gives us further illumination on this subject. And New Testament uses the word hagismos, Greek word hagismos, which is usually translated holiness. It is also translated to sanctify or to declare something holy or to make something holy by separating it. The New Testament concept of holiness is separation. It is not, uh, please remember, it is not ceremonial holiness. It is real holiness because it is real separation. Actually, it comes from a root word which means something which is separated for a very highly dignified purpose and therefore look at that and feel awe at it. This is a concept which even non-Christians understand, only thing the Christian concept is different. But a little, an illustration of the non-Christian concept would be very, very illuminating. We all hear about Afghanistan and the crisis in Afghanistan. And the government of India is continually airlifting people from Afghanistan and bringing them to India. Many of them are six settled in Afghanistan. When they had to flee Afghanistan, six from at least three temples, six temples, they brought their holy book with them. Among people of the world or religions of the world, six are one group who have to be admired for the way they handle their holy book. When they brought it from Afghanistan, they put their holy, holy book, the Guru Granth Sahab in a very special kind of suitcase and they carried it on their head. Six always carry their holy book on their head because for them it is a sanctified book. It is a book set apart from all the books in the world. And when it came to Delhi or uh, probably the Hindan Air Base, uh, a Sikh minister, member of parliament went took it from them and placed a suitcase on his head and came out. Today I saw the video in Danik Bhaskar. So the idea of something which is separated and therefore something which is to be respected is an idea which permeates the minds of people around the world. Against that idea, we Christians, when we look at our Christian life, then we can understand the, the concept of uh, separation much more clearly. If they think that a certain book is separate, or since they think that their holy book is separated from all profane books, and they respect it so much that they never keep it on the ground, then we Christians, who have been sanctified at the moment of our salvation and who have been called to a prolonged life of sanctification in this world and also a prolonged life where we have to demonstrate our justification through our day-to-day -day life, how much carefully we should handle the subject of practical justification, day-to-day -day justification and sanctification. I mean, if non-Christians 
give so much importance to something they consider as sanctified then we who have been united with christ and since we have been united with christ we have been separated from the world and covered with the righteousness of christ how much more clearly we should understand sanctification and therefore now here is the implication therefore how much more carefully we should carry our lives in this world they are carrying their holy book on their head we who understand biblical sanctification we are carrying our life in this world how much more carefully we should carry our lives and as we carry our lives in this world that devotion to sanctification and our sanctification should be visible in our attitudes in our words and also in our deeds what is called in hindi and also in many indian languages as manasa vachya karmana if those indian brethren they have such a respect towards their holy book which they consider sanctified then you and i who are united with christ and separated from the world how much more should be how much more important should we give about carrying our lives through this world in a sanctified manner in a dignified manner in a holy manner in a non profane manner are we careful before going further let me ask you are we careful many of you are working in offices some of you are retired some of you are homemakers some of you are evangelists some of you are retired and live in a neighborhood where your neighbors see you almost every day we just as they are carrying their holy book we are carrying the temple of god see the difference one is a book placed in a temple the other is a temple we are the temple of the holy spirit we are carrying that temple of the holy spirit every day in front of the people who watch us do they see christ in our lives are they able to say wow such and such person what an amazing person what a wonderful way of thinking about the world what a wonderful speech and look at his or her deeds amazing unbelievable is that the way people speak the concept of sanctification has uh, created two schools of thought two ways of thinking within the protestant community both of them are in error oh you may say brother if there are only two schools of thought and if both are in error what are we going to do i did not say that there are only two schools of thought i said there are two dominating schools of thought that is what i mean and please remember both of his, these dominating schools of thought are in error the right way of looking at it we find only in the scripture not in man's schools of thought one school of thought emphasizes holiness so much that they ignore doctrines they are known as the holiness movement a very good example is the older methodist church the methodist church founded by wesleys and therefore they are known as wesleyans also 
the Wesleyans placed a great emphasis on holiness. There is only one problem. They ignored doctrine. Please remember, if doctrine is ignored, then holiness has no value. Please remember, many, many of our neighbors, they don't know biblical doctrines, they don't know biblical truths, but they have a very highly ordered and holy life. I had a doctor in Gwalior, Dr. G. D. Hajik, Muslim. He was paralyzed from chest downwards. In spite of that, he kept on studying. He completed his BSc chemistry. And then he went on to study the Yunani system of medicine. And he practiced Yunani system of medicine. Once I spotted him and his interest in books, I started visiting him regularly. And soon my wife also started visiting him. We would often go, either both of us or me alone, and spend a lot of time with him. And what stunned me was this Muslim who is paralyzed from chest downwards, whose speech is so blurred that at that time his nephew had to interpret it to me, or his niece had to interpret it to me. That man prayed five times a day. And during their uh, festivals, this handicapped man fasted like healthy people. And whatever income came, he always separated an amount known as, which Muslims call as zakat. In fact, he had a box in front of him. And I came to know about his practices once when he opened his box, not he. When he, when he asked his nephew to open the box, and the box had many compartments. I asked him, Doc Sahib, ye kya hai? Then he explained, out of a hundred rupees that comes to him, he takes 30 for his day-to-day -day needs. And he keeps away 70, uh, about, no, I'm sorry, he, uh, 30 he takes and about uh, 40 he keeps away for doing some business. He was a very good businessman and he dealt in cash crops. And the remaining 30, some went for zakat, some went for other things. That is similar to the Old Testament system of tithing. 30% of his income he gave away to others. So if you think that an emphasis on holiness makes you a Christian, then our Muslim friends are much more holy and devoted than us. I also know of many Hindus during chilling winter, not North Indian winter, but the chilling winter of Kerala, just wearing one dhoti, no banyan, they rush from their house to the temple nearby. Some years ago when I taught at Rehoboth Theological Institute, the first building in which we had our classes was on the main road. Morning, five o'clock, the Roman Catholic Church would put on a song. It was a nuisance to me, disturbing the sleep, but it also taught me a lesson. Because of that noise, I would often get up and go to bathroom. And while I came to lay on my bed, which was adjacent to a glass window, uh, which was overlooking the road, I would see rush. Men and women rushing to church. And they often looked at that and I spotted Ladies, 80 year old, probably 80, 85, freshly bathed, water dripping from their hair in a fresh garment, rushing to the church for the morning mass. 
my dear friends they are all living a sanctified and a separated life without doctrine so whether it is non christians or christians a separated life a devoted life a life of devotion a life of presumed holiness does not bring you closer to god whether it is a christian or a non christian the greatest mistake of the holy holiness movement was placing a lot of emphasis on holiness without doctrine without doctrine any holiness is pagan holiness and look at what has happened to the methodist church today there is no there was no doctrinal foundation today what has happened now, i know many methodists very closely that's the reason why i'm saying this some 60 years ago some of them were some of the best bible expositors today their progeny doesn't know the abc of scripture why there was no emphasis on scripture emphasis only on holiness so that is the holiness movement on the other side is the knowledge movement they emphasize knowledge of the scriptures read and read and read no 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 read and read and read no more no more no more overlook life have the biggest culprit are the brethren the biggest culprit culprits in the knowledge movement are the brethren we lay so much emphasis on doctrine that i have heard dozens of people proclaiming that doctrine is more important than life they proclaim that life is more important than doctrine we proclaim that doctrine is more important than life what is the result in most places in kerala the brethren have an exceedingly bad testimony let me honestly say you may dislike it but having moved to kerala 27 years ago i found that when we go out for preaching the sharing the gospel house to house distribution of the gospel often if we declare that we are brethren people just don't want to do anything with us because their neighbor brethren people have such fantastic testimony for the devil we emphasized and over emphasized doctrine at the cost of life they emphasized life at the cost of doctrine in the end both of them are in the same boat our lives have messed up they have no testimony in the society in which they live we have no testimony in the society in which we live it was not like that five or six generations ago i still remember the first generation brethren you may ask hey brother you look to be you don't look so old to have witness first generation brethren actually i had my childhood in kerala and at that time many first generation brethren were alive including my great grandfather who was a first generation brethren and because of my exceeding interest in uh, brethren church history i made it a point to visit many of them meet many of them the first generation brethren maintained a balance between doctrine and life the second generation maintained somewhat of an emphasis on doctrine and life but by the time the third generation came the emphasis shifted to doctrine and doctrine alone no life we became people of knowledge just as they became people of holiness 
so both the holiness movement has gone away from god as well as the knowledge movement has gone away from god and today if you ask me in a neighborhood where brethren and these holiness movement people are living together neither of them have an exemplary life neither of them there are many denominational churches which also lay a great emphasis upon holiness i still remember brethren bible institute patanandetta where i taught for many years where i was principal for 3 years whenever i would be there in evening i would have a one hour free session free session means not according to syllabus but any subject which i considered important for students that would be doctrine that would be uh, issues that would be philosophy and a jacobite preacher come used to attend it with permission one day the jacobite said sir there is a problem with all of you you people emphasize doctrine too much and therefore there is no holiness among us our church emphasizes holiness so people lead a very holy life i asked him he was younger to me but i uh, i follow protocol so i said uh, achan father tell me one thing and you have to be honest every year on the day of easter all the alcohol shops in kerala are busy very busy have you seen any brethren coming there he was stunned and then i asked have you ever seen any jacobites coming there now he could not say yes he could not say no and i asked him one more question uh you think that you guys emphasize holiness much and therefore you have a holy life tell me one thing how many brethren evangelists can you point out who are alcoholics devoted alcoholics i said you show me 10 brethren who are devoted alcoholics i will show you a hundred of your priests who are devoted alcoholics i know that because uh, when i studied in seminary many of these uh, future priests studied with me so i know about their personal habits please remember the holiness people think that the knowledge people are a gone case because they don't have a holy life but look at their life too much emphasis on holiness but complete neglect of biblical doctrines the alcohol shops are uh, uh alcohol shops make profit on the easter because of them standing in queues but we who emphasize only doctrine what about us things are very bad things are very very bad please remember as a traveling preacher i visit a number of brethren assemblies and i see so much unholiness among us so much ranging from unholiness of speech up to moral unholiness i often ask elders of these churches top people in these churches brother why don't you take action see filth is something against which elders have to take action not to kick out the person but to shepherd that person in such a way that filth goes out from his life and without exception i always get 
one and the same answer brother if we ask that person to remove filth from his life his answer would be let the elders remove filth from their lives maybe if there are five not all five of them have filth but brethren assemblies have come to a stage where if there are five elders in a church members can easily point to filth in the lives of at least two of the elders and therefore they don't have the most important organ which makes a man a man that is his backbone they don't have it why don't they have it the entire emphasis on doctrines no emphasis at all like at all on life has resulted in a barren christianity where there is no sanctification let me repeat once again the holiness movement emphasizes holiness but without scripture and without scripture a true holiness is not possible and therefore their life has become barren and filthy we place our entire emphasis on doctrine but we neglect life we make stupid statements biblically stupid statements like doctrine is more important than life as though doctrines and life are two separate things nobody who has read the new testament properly can make that statement in his right mind never in the new testament does or in the old testament does the scripture separate between doctrine and life they are two sides of the same coin the holiness people have only one side they have messed up their life the knowledge people have one side of the coin they have messed up the other and therefore my dear brothers and sisters before going to the next point i gave such an elaborate background because most of our doctrinal studies have reduced to mere catalogs have you ever seen any person who spends all his life reading catalogs we all love books isn't it and if you don't love books you ought to love books we all love books you can see a bunch of books which are sitting so close to me on my right side also which is not visible on the camera there is a bunch of uh, seven books are they all catalogs <laughs> not on your life nobody reads a dictionary a to z nobody reads a catalog a to z but somehow our presentation of bible doctrine has become a catalog justification by faith romans 5 verses 1 and 2 definition of justification justification happens this way justification this 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 what about application to life our emphasis on factual christianity instead of real christianity balanced christianity has taken away sanctification from our heads first and then our lives the scripture says i want to mention six essential points about sanctification sanctification means separation and biblical sanctification means separation from profane things unto god i want to remind six essential points about sanctification number 1 we make a beginning not full just make a beginning first thessalonians 5:21 and 22 first thessalonians 5 21 and 22 we read test and examine all things many of you have the king james bible where it says prove all things actually 
prove in King James version means test and prove or test and establish. Just as a goldsmith rubs gold on touchstone to see whether it is real gold, the scripture says, test and examine all things. Hold strongly to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Doesn't say abstain from evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil. I want to quote Sam 1, 1 and 2. Blessed is the man. I hope all of you understand Hindi. If not, please remember it is our Raj Bhasha. I have memorized that verse in Hindi. So it comes naturally to me in Hindi. Blessed is the man who does not walk according to the counsel of the wicked, who does not stand in the way of the evil ones, and who does not sit in the seat of the scoffers. Sanctification. Here, when it says abstain from all appearance of evil, this reminds us of Sam 1, which reminds each one of us that we should be away even from the appearance of sin. Brothers and sisters, we should neither be people of knowledge nor people of holiness. We should be biblical Christians and a biblical Christian understands that knowledge and life life and knowledge they are two sides of the same coin doctrine and holy living holy living and doctrine they are two sides of the same coin if one side is missing the other will eventually degenerate and mess up we see that among the brethren we see it widely we loved knowledge we despised holy living so much so that now a lot of leadership in our churches lead such an unholy life that they don't have the guts or backbone to correct people in their church. And we see people, holiness people who have become so degenerate that on Easter, you can find them in a mile long queue standing there to buy alcohol because for the last few days they were fasting and they were abstaining from meat and alcohol. Neither of them is right Christianity. Right Christianity is study the word of God. Let the word of God transform your mind. And once your mind is transformed, let that show in a transformed behavior, a sanctified behavior. May the Lord help us to understand these things. Lord willing, we will continue our study in the coming uh, uh, Tuesdays. We have a lot of scope. Please uh, remind uh, more young people from your church. Dear friends, I am confident that you enjoyed listening to this question answer video by Dr. Johnson C. Philip. He would love to get your questions. Please post your questions in the comment box below this video and he will prepare a video reply for you. Please post only one question at a time and make it as detailed as possible so that Dr. Philip has no problem in understanding exactly what you mean. Also, please encourage this ministry by subscribing to this channel. Below this video, there is a subscribe button. Please click it. Also please click the bell icon near it to complete the process of subscribing. Thank you very much for being such an encouragement to our channel.